Ava Gardner, a siren with a whiskey glass in one hand and a middle finger raised to the world with the other. She was a tempest, a force of nature that left people breathless. Her love life? A chaotic masterpiece, a series of passionate, tumultuous affairs that made her personal life as compelling as any of her on-screen performances. And then there was Sinatra. In the book The Secret Conversations by Peter Evans and herself, she laid it all out, raw and unfiltered, describing Frank Sinatra as the god of sex. Quoting Gardner, The trouble was Frank and I were too much alike. Bappy, Gardner's older sister, said I was Frank in drag. There was a lot of truth in that. He was the only husband I had that Bappy didn't approve of straight off the bat. I'm not saying she disliked him. On the contrary, she thought he was great, but not for me. I should have listened to her. Gardner continues, here comes the sex part. He was good in the feathers. You don't pay much attention to what other people tell you when a guy's good in the feathers, she said. From his 2014 book, titled Memoirs, singer, songwriter Paul Anker describes a scene where they would be in the health club at the casino in the steam room. Suddenly, a couple of giggling showgirls, also stark naked, would tiptoe in or, occasionally, Frank would have ladies of the night brought in. Then he'd disappear to a little massage room to have sex with them. Is it me or is it getting warm in here? Frank Sinatra, the god of sex. Ex Gardner, she was brutally honest. Like my girlfriends say, when a man's that good in bed, you don't care about warnings or red flags. You just dive in, consequences be damned. And dive in, she did, into a love affair that was as explosive as it was destructive. Sinatra, with his charm and his talent in the sack, he had Ava hooked. Gardner then goes on to describe the real Sinatra. She lays out that Sinatra had threatened suicide and overdosed many times just for attention. Frank and I had been married barely a couple of years. The marriage was obviously unravelling even then. I'm just surprised it lasted as long as it did. It was a bad time for Frank. Poor darling, he was so insecure. He was broke, he didn't have a job. He was hanging on to his place in Palm Springs by the skin of his teeth. It was the last real asset he had. If he'd lost that, it would have been the end of the line for him. He had made a lot of enemies in his good years, before the Bobby Soxers found somebody new to throw their panties at. Nobody wanted to be around him. There were no hangers-on. He didn't amuse them anymore. He couldn't lift a cheque. There was nobody but me. He had burned most of his bridges with the press. There was a catalogue of disasters. His voice had gone. AMGM had let him go. His agent had let him go. So had CBS. On top of all that, the poor bastard suffered a hemorrhage of his vocal cords and couldn't talk, let alone sing, for about six weeks. That's when I saw through those people. I saw through Hollywood. Naive little country girl that I was. I saw through all the phoniness, all the crap. Just a quick note, comment, like and subscribe. The buttons make cool animations now when you do. Go on, try it. Now, back to the story. Gardner, when asked about the mob and how they were supposed to take care of Frank, you're not listening to me, baby. Frank was flat broke when we tied the knot. I don't know where those stories came from that the mafia was taking care of him. They should have been. But the f***ing so-called family was nowhere to be seen when he needed them. It really ticks me when I read how generous the mob was when he was on the skids. But I was the one paying the rent when he couldn't get arrested. I was the one making the pot boil, baby. It was me. Wow, now just for the record, Sinatra's career turns around in 53 with the movie From Here to Eternity, where he wins an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor. I think I need a cocktail. Thanks for watching over and out. Like, comment and subscribe.